I'll be in uh, Heidelberg for like a month in the summer. So it's not too far. <laughs> okay. uh, it's not too far, but it's hard to predict what will be the situation with. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we are ready to, to start with the region. It's your okay. floor. Thanks. Um, how much time are you giving me? Is it an hour? Mm, normally, it's a Russian style seminar, so we have an hour and a half at least. So okay. you have plenty of time. Okay. I probably won't take that long, long but uh, uh, no, thank no, you. Just if, if, if you want, you can stop at any time, but okay. you have at least Great. half hour plus normal one hour. Great. Okay. okay. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the five vertex model and about some general class of statistical mechanics models, uh, of which the five vertex model is just one. Uh, this is going to be mostly based on joint work with. Uh, East Van Prouse, who's at Helsinki, and based on earlier work with Jan de Heer and Sam Watson. Jan is in Melbourne and Sam is at Brown. Um, and I guess the starting point is the, uh, uh, Dimer model, this uh, uh, uniform lozenge tiling model. So a lozenge tiling is just, you can, this is a tiling of a region in the plane, the hexagon with these three types of three orientations of tiles, three tiles, the yellow, the blue, and the pink, which are just 60 degree rhombi. And of course you take a random tiling and it uh, represents, you can think of it as a projection of a three dimensional object, a surface, a two dimensional surface in R3. Um, and you, just by sort of looking at a random sample of such a tiling with these boundary conditions, you can see that it's non-homogeneous. And in fact, if you think of, if you could view the surface on the side like this, you would see that uh, in fact, a typical tiling, uh, uh, if you did many samples, a typical tiling would always sort of lie near a particular, in this case, smooth, uh, surface spanning the same boundary. So what, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, you, you should think of the, the epsilon as the size of the tiles going to zero. And then I'm gonna take a uniform random tiling of the, hex, of the hexagon here, and then think of it as a surface in, in R3. And, are, and you specifying, uh, are you specifying some boundary condition? Yes, it has to just fit exactly into the hexagon. It's just a tiling of the hexagon. But if you, once you have, Right. If you think about how that tile, that that hexagon, is a is a projection of a certain uh, a curve, a wire, a piecewise linear curve in R three, which is consists of this uh, this uh, you know six sides of some some cube, right? And so this that that the, just the boundary conditions, the fact that your tiling has to fit exactly, will force the surface to be spanning this uh, sort of wire frame here. And whether the surface is just smooth or algebraic? Yeah, the, the resulting surface, yeah, is, it's, it's only smooth. It's not algebraic. It's piecewise analytic. Um, but the, right, so here's the theorem. The, this is called the lozenge tiling limit shape theorem, which uh, was, is now 20 years old, uh, originally due to Henry Cohn, myself, and Jim Prop. Uh, that is, you can describe the, the surface as a graph. When you describe the surface as a graph of a function, this function, uh, the function H, so here, let me read the theorem. The function H describing the limit shape. Here R is the region we're tiling, and it's a real valued function. Uh, <coughs> this uh, limit shape, this the smooth limit shape is the unique minimizer of a certain surface tension integral certain integral, uh, you look for all functions H with the correct uh, you know, Lipschitz constraints uh, that, and uh, you're looking for the one which minimizes this surface tension integral. So it's the integral of a certain function sigma, which depends on the slope of the, the gradient of the function H integrated over R. Uh, so it's just like a, as if it was a, 
so bubble surface, a minimal surface, except that <coughs> you, the, the function you're minimizing is not uh, isotropic. It depends, it's a non-trivial function of the gradient. Um, and oh, here, here, I just, uh, uh, just a minute. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the surface tension sigma is, is, uh, is a function of the gradient of H and the gradient is constrained to lie in a certain triangle. If you think about the possible gradients of such a surface, it's constrained to, a, the, 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 the normals are constrained to a certain orthant in R3, positive orthant if you like. Uh, so the, and so you can think of, if you like, you can think of sigma as being, you know, plus infinity outside of this uh, triangular region. And it's a strictly convex uh, uh, function on the spa space of allowed slopes. And that strict convexity is what leads to the unique, the existence of the unique minimizer of this integral here. All right, so that's what, that's, uh, so, so we can, explain the, this theorem, and let me try to explain this theorem in a, just a, a word or two. Uh, when you, you know, it's, it's just a combinatorial theorem. You, when you zoom in to a point in the surface, what you, what you see, you know, what you see is the, the well, here, let me, let me think. Uh, if, if I, if, let's go back to this picture here, sorry. Sorry to jump around. If I zoom in to a point like over here, I, what I'm gonna see is that even though this, the, the surface globally is non-homogeneous, I will see locally some sort of homo homogeneous dent, uh, you know, distribution of pinks, yellows, and blues. And that, that will have a particular local, that will define a particular local slope. Once you fix the density of the, well, I, sorry, I changed the colors, the greens, the blues, and the reds, let's call that, let's call S the density of greens, T the density of blues, and one minus S minus T, the density of red tiles. Let's just say the density per unit area. Then uh, uh, if, if you fix that density, there's a unique uh, Gibbs measure on the plane with that uh, density. And it has a certain growth rate that the number of configurations with that particular slope. So for each slope ST, there's an associated uh, growth rate, which is minus, which we call minus sigma. That is the number of tilings of a large region like this sort of n by n torus. If I want to think about the number of tilings with a particular slope, it's roughly, it's the first order is exponential in the area times some constant, and that constant is sigma st, which is what we call sigma st. So sigma st is some, just some sort of entropy. All right, and then uh, of course, when you think about how, what is a typical surface spanning this frame, this uh, wire frame, uh, the surface of course wants to maximize the entropy because it's a, you know, you're just taking a uniform random one, but then it's pinned, because it's pinned to the boundary, it has to bend and bending, uh, being, being, being pinned to the boundary makes it uh, lose entropy because the, you know, in order to, to, to be glued to the boundary here, it's gonna, has to be very steep and steep, st steep slope has low entropy. So there's some interplay between the, the wireframe forcing it to some non, to some position that it doesn't want to be in and it's still trying to maximize the entropy. And that's the, that's the, uh, that's how the theorem is uh, proved essentially is that the, this is the maximize the entropy with it with the boundary constraints. Okay, uh, and so on this slide there are two other, uh, there's one important, uh, two other variables that I'm introducing, which I'm going to call capital X and capital Y down here. Uh, so th these are the uh, dual variables to the, to the slope S and T. So uh, and to explain, let me, rather than taking a, uh, fixing the slope, we can, we can instead uh, change the weights of the tiles. So instead of having all the tiles have weight one, if I give the three orientations of tiles weight one, e to the x and e to the y, for example, e to the x is gonna be uh, green, 
And e to the, each blue tile has weight e to the y, each green tile has weight e to the x, and the red tiles have weight one. Then, the, then you take a random tiling weighted with this, the product of the weights of the tiles. In other words, you can think of x as the energy for a, for a green tile and y as the energy for a blue tile or minus the energy. Then uh, as x increases, you know, you'll get more green tiles and as y increases, you get more blue tiles. Those x and y variables control, also control the densities uh, uh, of the tiles. And therefore, uh, instead of fixing S and T, we can find an X and Y, uh, a related X and Y. And, and then the, once, I, once I fix those X and Y values, it will, the system will naturally have a, have a preferred slope, ST. But now you don't have boundary conditions, right? Yeah, this is just, yeah, this is no boundary. Yeah, think of this as either free boundary conditions or maybe for a torus. Once I impose the boundary conditions, then, then uh, yeah, then it the, doesn't really make sense to talk about X and Y because the total number of tiles of each type will be determined. So X and Y play no role. But if there's, if there's a sort of free boundary conditions or if you allow all possible boundary conditions, then the, when I fix X and Y, it will, the system will pick out a particular slope. And it's that, that map from the slope variables to the X and Y variables, that's the one which is sort of being defined by the surface tension or rather the gradient of the surface tension. Okay, any questions so far? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, this, was, this is about the Lawson's tiling model, which is somehow, you know, the first one we could work out because it's uh, the free energy and so on. Uh, this free energy can, is, is a determinant of some Castelline type matrix, adjacency type matrix. But there are lots of other stat bank models, two dimensional stat bank models, which also have limit shapes. And we'd like to understand these other models as well. You know, there's a well-known uh, six vertex model or square ice model. Uh, there's some FK percolation model, which is somehow related, spanning tree models. Uh, and well, anyway, many, many other models which have limit shapes and we want to uh, st study them with the same technique. Uh, and so I, what I wanna do is spend a few slides telling you about a general, some new, new ideas which apply to general models, general gradient models. And by gradient models, I mean models where the uh, surface tension only depends on this gradient. Okay, so uh, just uh, <clears throat> so that here we're we're gonna we're gonna be in two dimensions. So we have a. Peter, may I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, that's for all these models, this Arctic uh, yep. zone called principle or whatever. I, I remember from your old works with, with Andre, that was fascinating that there is a certain Arctic zone when there That's is right. no... That's right. The, well, the, right now there's not, there are very few models which we can solve exactly. Uh, but they all do have this sort of Arctic phenomenon. What the models that we have in mind from 2D, they typically have this height function, this one dimensional height function, and there's a maximum possible slope and there's a minimum possible slope. In fact, the set of slopes is a, is a, they're, they're Lipschitz surfaces. Uh, just like in this case, the, the set of slopes was constrained to some triangle. Typically the set of slopes is constrained to some uh, compact region in the plane, some com convex uh, polygon. Um, and right, that when you go to a maximal slope, then you will get indeed a frozen configuration, like, like, in, this, like in this case here, right? You see near the corners that you're sort of at the maximum slope. And then there's this whole uh, faceted region where, the, where the, uh, all the tiles are lined up. It's a, and we call that frozen. And, and yeah, in this picture also, this is, a, what is this picture? It's a, just a percolation model. Uh, so edge percolation on, bond percolation on the honeycomb graph, but there's some uh, constraints that the, that the components of the configuration connect boundary points from one to the other. 
and it's it's a little hard to motivate motivate those constraints. But uh, if you if you put the impose those constraints on the model, you will see a, a sort of ar nice Arctic phenomenon near the corners. The system is frozen, uh, and then there's this sort of disordered region in the center, which which uh, is mysterious. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about general gradient models. And by gradient model, I mean the surface tension only depends on the gradient. Uh, for, and, and also we're in two dimensions. I shouldn't, I should have said that. So it's a, it's a, if you like, it's a surface, a two dimensional surface in R3. Um, and an example, of course, the example to have in mind is just the soap film surfaces, the minimal surfaces. That's one example. Uh, another example is the uh, Lausen styling model. And um, we'll see some another example later, the five vertex model, which is about the, what, the, what the talk is about. Okay, so we're gonna assume that the surface tension, just for the sake of this talk, we assume the surface tension is strictly convex and smooth. Uh, those can be uh, weakened, um, but it's easier to state the theorems in this setting. That's, that's what is typically the case, uh, the interesting case. So, and sigma is of course defined, as I said, defined on some compact region, which, well, we could imagine it as defined on a non-compact region, but it's defined on some region in, in the plane and it takes real values. <clears throat> that's this uh, surface tension function, which you saw the, uh, the, the strictly convex function. Because it's strictly convex, uh, you can define on that region a, a, a Riemannian metric just from the, well, so the Hessian matrix of sigma is a positive definite matrix. The matrix of second derivatives is positive definite by, by strict convexity. And therefore you can make a metric, all right? It's not the first thing you would think to do, but there is a well-defined metric on the domain of sigma uh, where the, you know, which is just a Riemannian metric made from the components of the matrix of the, the second derivative. And, uh, <clears throat> and so here, here, you know, just for the sake of illustration, sigma is defined on my triangle. The gradient of sigma uh, maps you to the Legendre dual variables, the X and Y plane. And the image of the, you know, interior here is, is called the amoeba here. And uh, in, yeah, if you don't know what the amoeba is, it's not important. The right-hand side is not so important for this talk. But uh, uh, for the Lausenstelling model, the image is actually the amoeba of, a, of an algebraic curve. And the, but the, the fact that this, the, the interesting th fact about this metric is that the map, uh, this, this bijection from the left to the right is an isometry for the metric. So you can define the metric over here because the free energy is also strictly convex. And this is just an isometry. So there's really one sort of underlying metric space to the model here. But Which, the domain n depends on the boundary condition, on the choice of the euro. The, the, sorry, the sorry, domain. The domain, yeah. Here I'm not working on a particular domain uh, where I'm, uh, uh, here I'm just working on the, the, uh, the set of possible slopes of surfaces with arbitrary boundary conditions. So rather than just thinking about the hexagon, think about a a more general uh, domain in the plane that I want to tile with lozenges or whatever. And, but I still have to deal with the same uh, gradient variational problem to find the limit shape for that. And that gradient variation, the variational problem will have the slopes restricted to some, uh, you know, region N. And on that region N, there's a, there's a special uh, metric. And <clears throat> what we, uh, what we learned from Gauss is that when you have a metric in R2, there's a natural, a Riemannian metric in R2, there's a natural set of isothermal coordinates, U and V, or if you like, it's a natural conformal coordinate Z. Uh, and what's special, what's special about this conformal coordinate is that in, when you write the uh, metric in these coordinates, it, it essentially, uh, is a conformal image of the standard Euclidean metric in the UV plane. So the metric in these new coordinates is just a scalar multiple, varying scalar multiple of the Euclidean metric in UV coordinates. 
<clears throat> so that's a very old theorem. How do, you, how do you find that those isothermal coordinates? Well, you have to solve this Beltrami equation, which is kind of a, a you know, difficult uh, PDE, although Gauss uh, showed that we could reduce, you could reduce that PDE to an ODE uh, uh, as long as, yeah. You could reduce it, reduce it to an ODE. And, and that PDE is called the Beltrami equation. Uh, how do you find Z, right? If I just hand you a metric on a region in the plane, uh, there's a procedure, I guess, by which you find this, iso or this conformal coordinate Z. Uh, and well, here's the equation, right? Z, right? just take this, this uh, ratio of partial derivatives with respect to the underlying, the, the, you know, the variables S and T. And it's equal to this uh, uh, Beltrami differential, which is built from the second derivatives of sigma. Here, here H is the Hessian matrix of sigma. And okay, so there's a simple manipulation, right? Zs over Zt is this thing. And since we've already introduced these variables, capital X and capital Y, which we remember are the Legendre dual variables to S and T, this is the uh, slightly tricky, I mean, it's not tricky, it's easy, but the uh, uh, you realize rather that the that that Beltrami equation is equivalent to the following equation, which is that the z derivative of x over z derivative of t equals this square root of the determinant of the Hessian. So somehow the the the, the right okay. This is just a little bit of you know formal manipulation of derivatives. So nothing nothing sophisticated going on here except for the. The theorem is, is non-trivial. <laughs> Sorry, what are the boundary conditions for these equations? So far, there's no, we don't have to worry about boundary conditions. Well, the uh, Z is a conformal map. It's, our space N is our the triangle of allowed slopes. And we can think of Z because it's a conformal map. We can take it. We can uniformize it with any domain. But let's let's, for the sake of this talk, think of Z as a map from that triangle to the upper half plane. Okay, to, or or to the disk, if you like. So uh, you know, once we find some conformal coordinate, we can use a Riemann map to to use it to, to for any other conformal coordinates. Right now, the, I haven't introduced any boundary conditions yet. Here we're just dealing with the sort of parameter space. We're reparameterizing the, the uh, minimal surface equation in terms of a new coordinate z. And, and yes, z is defined on the, the triangle. Okay. Yeah, yes, so, sorry, but, but uh, the link shape equation don't have a unique solution. There are like a family of solutions of it. And where is this family is lying in this problem? Oh, uh, yes, okay. If you, if you permit me to go back now, let's go back to the lozenge tiling limit shape, right? The, the theorem, the, the <clears throat> The theorem is the following. We take any domain in the plane R, uh, right, which might be the hexagon, it might be some more complicated domain. And uh, on that boundary, yeah, I didn't, I, sorry, the statement is not complete. That's why you're confused. <laughs> I forgot to, you take your region R, on the boundary of R, there's some uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions for the function H, right? You have some prescribed, height along the boundary, you know, R lies in the plane and you have some height function on the boundary and you want to consider all functions with which match the boundary conditions. And among those functions which match the boundary conditions, you want to minimize the service tension integral. So here R is a parameter and also the height along the boundary of R is a parameter. Does that? Yeah, it's clear. Okay, so, so in the, in that setting, there's a unique, there's, there exists a unique minimizer. And that's the one we're looking for. Okay, more questions? Okay, so let me, let me pause for a moment and tell you what a kappa harmonic function is. Uh, because the, at the end of the day, we're gonna write our solution in terms of harmonic functions. And so a, 
Well, a kappa harmonic function is a harmonic function, but with a varying conductivity. So let's let kappa, uh, and here we're again working on the plane. So we have a, let's let kappa be a positive real function on the plane or some part of the plane. And we're gonna call a function each kappa harmonic if it satisfies this uh, equation, uh, right? The, right, which is the uh, uh, Laplacian with varying conductance kappa. So you just take the gradient of H, multiply it by kappa, and then you take the, you know, L dot that divergence. So if kappa is a constant, it's just the standard Laplacian, but if kappa is, is varying, it's not the standard Laplacian, it's a, it's a kappa Laplacian, kappa varying Laplacian. So, so this, this operator, uh, uh, divergence of gradient, divergence of kappa times gradient is the, called the Laplacian with conductance kappa. And if you like to think of prob in probabilistic terms, um, this, you can think of this as the Laplacian with a drift. Uh, which is determined by this uh, gradient of kappa over kappa, right? So because you can rewrite this this uh, Laplace, this uh, kappa conductance Laplacian as the usual Laplacian. So if I apply this to H, I can rewrite it as kappa times the usual Laplacian of H plus this uh, gradient of H dotted with the gradient of kappa. And uh, even more sort of concrete example, suppose we just have the integer lattice and uh, we connect adjacent vertices with, a, with an edge which has a conductance, which is a geometrically growing function of position. Like the conductance on this edge is one, then C, then C squared and so on. Now, if I ask you, uh, you know, let's take a random walk with these conductances, the, if I started this vertex, the probability of, of going to the right versus the probability of going to the left is, you know, is proportional to C squared going to the right and C going to the left, and which means that the, uh, you know, the random walk has, a, if C is bigger than one, the random walk has a slight preference of going to the right and it's a constant drift uh, going to the right. So the harmonic functions with respect to this, uh, you know, exponentially growing conductance correspond to random walks with a constant drift uh, to the right. And you can imagine a two-dimensional version of that, uh, that kind of a, a random walk. Right, how is that relevant to the current, current pro you know, problem? Um, what we're gonna do is, well, we're in two dimensions and we're gonna take kappa, our conductance, our varying conductance to be the square root of the determinant of the Hessian, uh, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, Z <coughs> as a function, yeah, okay. As a function of Z I, in the upper half plane. Um, now, if, if we, uh, this, this equation, this, this Beltrami equation, which we, I showed you the Beltrami equation boiled down to xz over tz equals minus i times, while well, the square root of the determinant of h, which is now kappa, right? This equation, uh, which relates the x and the t variable, just tells us exactly that, uh, well, when you, when you work it out in re real variables, it tells you that t is a kappa harmonic function, and x here is the kappa harmonic conjugate. Uh, well, of course, the little calculation is here. It's not so important what the calculation is, but the, 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 this equation here, the Beltrami equation, when you write it in terms of this, these other variables, x and y and t and s, it tells you that s and t are kappa harmonic functions and x and y are their harmonic, kappa harmonic conjugates. And if, so this, these, these slope variables, so, so, right, so the, the let me, let me go back to the beginning, right? We had this complicated equation to solve, this boiler, this uh, you know, minimization problem for a surface tension, non-isotropic sur surface tension. We rewrite it in terms of the intrinsic conformal coordinate Z. And when we do that, we find that the gradients, the S and T are exactly kappa harmonic functions 
and the X and Y variables, the, the corresponding conjugate X and Y variables are also Kappa harmonic, well, they're one over Kappa harmonic functions and they're somehow conjugate to each other. Sorry, what's star? Star is just the Hodge star. Just rotation by 90 degrees in the plane. So you take, uh, right, this, right, this equation is uh, equivalent to the fact that when you take the gradient of T, multiply by Kappa, you rotate it by 90 degrees, and you get the gradient of X. Okay, thanks. Right, well, so here's the most important, here's the include conclusion. This is the most important slide. Uh, Richard, excuse yes. me. Uh, when you have usual harmonic function and it's conjugate, the sum up to I is holomorphic function. Yes. What in this setting is there some nice combination of dual uh, and K harmonic function, which is resembles holomorphic or? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I, well, yes and no, I guess is the answer. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, it, you know, they're, they're harmonic conjugates, they're kappa harmonic conjugates. So in some sense, they, you know, they're, they act like a holomorphic function in some respects, but not in others, right? There's no nice, uh, you know, you can't sum two such functions to get another one. I mean, you can't multiply them or anything. So it's not likely you get an algebra. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, here's the conclusion. Uh, and this, you know, this is a theorem which, you know, we just proved to recently, could have been proved by Darbu, you know, 100 years ago, he, he, but he wasn't uh, maybe interested in this particular thing. None of the techniques we use are, are modern. Uh, it's just differentiation, really. Uh, but the functions, S and T, as we saw, were Kampa harmonic, but there's also this third function, if I take here, H is a solution to my minimizing equation, H minus SX plus DY. These are all Kappa harmonic functions. I mean, this, we proved this, we somehow proved the S for S and T, but the proof for the third one is not so hard. It's a similar just differentiation. Uh, they're all Kappa harmonic functions with respect to con the conformal coordinate Z. So the, what you find is that once you rewrite the minimization equation in terms of the conformal coordinate Z, everything becomes simple and in, in the sense of being harmonic, kappa harmonic, right? And as a corollary, uh, <clears throat> well, what are these quantities S, T, and here, this is just the, uh, this is like the intercept of the tangent plane. So let me explain. It was supposed, if I wanna describe the minimizing the graph of the, the, the surface has a graph of my function H. H is my height function. I think of it's a graph, which is now a surface in R3. Uh, and I can present that graph as the envelope of its tangent planes. And those tangent planes have the following form. The tangent planes to the graph have the following form, X3, which is the third coordinate, I couldn't call it Z because we, Z is our conformal coordinate, but X3 is the third coordinate, the height. Uh, it's SX plus TY, those are, because S and T are the slopes, the X and, X and Y slopes. And C, this quantity C is, is by definition, is H minus SX plus TY. So these, the three coefficients defining the coordinate, the tangent plane are all moving harmonically, kappa harmonically as functions of the complex variable Z. <clears throat> which means that we can describe that, you know, if we know the boundary conditions for those planes, uh, we can just by harmonic extension, kappa harmonic extension, define the, the equation in the interior just by ex harmonic extension. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe a, a, let me go back to, let me go to the next slide. And then I'll come back to the rest of this slide. So here's a particular setting. Remember, this is our lozenge tiling where we had this uh, wireframe boundary, which was part of this hexagon. And you can see in this picture that the, the slope of the tangent planes to the surface 
along the boundary is completely determined, right? Over here, the slope is, a, you know, whatever the blue slope is, the orange slope and the purple slope, right? The, the boundary slopes are determined and therefore we can determine what's going on inside just by harmonic extension. It's almost like turning the problem, this complicated variational problem into a, into a you know, standard Dirichlet problem, just find the harmonic extension of with, with some Dirichlet boundary conditions. That, and that's exactly what happens for the actual dimer model because uh, uh, for the dimer model, kappa, the, that varying conductance happens to be constant. It's not just a varying conductance, it's actually a constant conductance because the Hessian determinant is constant. For, for the dimer model, the minimizing surface graph is the envelope of a family of harmonically moving planes. What do I mean by that? I mean the coefficients S, T, and C are just harmonic functions of this variable Z. Which, which allows us to solve for a quite large family of boundary conditions. You fix your arbitrary region, fix some arbitrary height function. You can solve the, uh, that Euler-Lagrange equation for the, for the minimizer in the Daimler model. So this, this function- uh, uh, yes. By solving, you mean just to the existing solution because we actually- Not existence. We, we can represent the solution as a solution to the Dirichlet problem to just the harmonic, right? Once we know the, like I said, once we know the, the slopes along the boundary, we can just use a harmonic extension to find the slopes in the interior. Uh, so we can represent the surface as this envelope of this known family of planes. So we've reduced the, we've reduced the, this nonlinear problem to a linear problem, which is solving the standard Laplacian, right? Harmonic extension solve the Laplacian, standard Laplacian equation on some domain with some fixed boundary conditions, right? That's a, that's a you know, trivial, you know, I mean, PDE 101 problem. Find the harmonic extension of a of some uh, with some fixed boundary conditions. Sorry, but uh, uh, in in order to reduce uh, the uh, the whole problem uh, to this uh, uh, simple one, you need uh, to find uh, nice coordinates, and uh, that's uh, the difficulty. So if you uh, have it, uh, let's say a priori, then uh, the whole problem of finding is easy, but uh, so the hard part is uh, uh, actually uh, sigma, uh, which is uh, not the easiest one. That's correct, that's correct. Everything depends on finding sigma and then, uh, you know, you have to hope that you can, uh, right, right. Well, I haven't told you how to find sigma, right? Sigma is sort of the, but once you found sigma once and for all, then you can in some sense, sometimes use harmonic function theory to give all limit shapes for all domains with that particular, for that particular model. And for the dimer model, we have an explicit formula for sigma. And for the five vertex model, which I'm about to introduce, uh, we also have a sigma. Would Sorry. that methodology work even if you have a, the Arctic circle where your surface is not that smooth? Yes. Yes, it does. In fact, uh, uh, you'll, we'll see some examples, uh, right? But in fact, the Arctic Circle sort of makes things easier because when we have an Arctic Circle, we already, we know a priori what the slope uh, along the boundary is, right? It has to match the slope uh, the, of those faceted regions, which you see. I mean, if so, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm, I, I, maybe I'm cheating a little bit because it's not a priori obvious that, that, that these facets exist. But if you knew for some reason that those facets exist, then you would know the slope along the boundary and you could use harmonic extension to get the, the slopes everywhere. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, very convincingly even. <laughs> okay, okay. So this, this quantity square root of kappa, this quantity kappa or the square root of kappa is, is known to physicists and it's called the stiffness or the Luttinger parameter uh, when they talk about uh, uh, 
random interfaces of this type. And the prediction is that the, the, if, you, if, if you're not just interested in the limit shape, but also how, how close you are to the limit shape, the fluctuations around the limit shape, uh, the physics prediction, which we really don't have any way to, to test right now, is that the fluctuations are given by a, a kappa Gaussian free field in the appropriate conformal structure. So this is a kind of a mysterious uh, generalization of the Gaussian free field where you have a varying conductance. But we can't really say anything about that, but it's interesting that there's a- You mean, you mean, uh, you mean that the, uh, the Nabla squared Lagrangian uh, density is multiplied by kappa? No. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Is that what I mean? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry, that's correct. So, 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 so it looks like it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a reduction of a high dimensional Gaussian field. So the kappa is sort of the volume of the internal dimension, which you reduce on time. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you have a different way of thinking. I wouldn't have thought about it that way, but uh, it could be. But it's- well, I, I mean, I, I actually, I meant to ask uh, on several occasions, you can talk about, you, you know this question probably. Uh, sometimes this, uh, so the limit shape sometimes is like a boundary of a high dimensional. Uh, so it's, some, it's sometimes it's useful to think of a limit shape as a, as a, of a boundary of a three dimensional body. And yes. Then, so the, the uh, the tiling is, is like a projection of a like a three dimensional, like a plane partition of some kind, and and, and, yes, and, yes. and these, these things are related to the toric geometry of our you know, three, sure. three, three dimensional complex manifold. So, so in that sense, it is not so. So the actual dynamics is, is three real or even three complex dimensional. So it's not surprising that you have a modified uh, Gaussian field in, in the, on the boundary. So, okay. Okay. Sure, right, but but you're right. I mean, you could think of just as the gradient, gradient. I mean, it's the Gaussian free field associated to the gradient f squared times times kappa, right? So the, the, that's why kappa is like the stiffness, right? The higher. Right. That's is. why you had this equation of motion, which was nabla kappa nabla equals to zero. Yes, yes. That's the equation of motion for that for that. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, what does this have to do? So th there's a way, if you want to solve this uh, kappa harmonic function equation, uh, it's not as easy as solving the kappa harmonic, the, the, the harmonic equation. Uh, but if you take the square root of kappa, which is now the fourth root of the determinant, then you, if you substitute, if, if you, if rather than, if you take H and you multiply it by the square root of kappa, then this new variable H tilde will satisfy a Schrodinger e equation uh, instead of the, instead of, right, if, if so, sorry, <laughs> let me start over. If A satisfies the kappa harmonic equation, then H times C, psi, where psi is the square root of kappa, satisfies the Schrodinger equation. It's just a simple, simple substitution, uh, right? Standard Laplacian minus some potential of H tilde equals zero. And the potential is just the, the Laplacian of psi over psi. What the point? Uh, the point of this uh, is that if you if you happen to be lucky and psi is harmonic, then the potential is zero, and you can turn your kappa harmonic equation into an actual harmonic equation for this new variable h tilde. And that's exactly what happens in the five vertex model. The five vertex model is. The kappa is, is, is complicated, it's a varying conductance, but its potential is trivial. It's, it's, it's the, the square root of kappa is harmonic. For the five vertex model, psi is a harmonic function, therefore kappa harmonic functions are very simple. They are the form, the ratio of a harmonic function divided by psi, where psi is this uh, fourth root of the Hessian. Therefore, we can solve very easily the kappa so, harmonic. So, so far, you haven't defined the five vertex model. Yep, yep. I apologize. <laughs> I could have organized the talk differently, but it's coming up on the next slide. Right. So, this is just a little preview. Why we care? Why? Why am I talking about all this stuff? 
And the, the reason is when we get to the five vertex model, it has this very special property, which allows us to write all the limit shapes in terms of actual harmonic functions, not just Kappa harmonic functions. Okay, so let's go to the five vertex model, unless there are any questions. <clears throat> okay, so five vertex model. You, you may all be familiar with the six vertex model. This is a special case. The five vertex model is a special case of the six vertex model where there's only five allowed vertices, right? Uh, so it's a model of edge configurations on Z2, uh, just like you see here. Uh, the edge, the paths, there's non-intersecting lattice path model where the paths go north and east and they don't intersect each other. So this is a typical configuration here. Locally, at each vertex, you see either no edges or two vertical edges or two horizontal edges or the corners, the north to east or the east to north. And the, you know, generally, we're going to just give five different weights to those five uh, local configurations, but it doesn't hurt to rescale so that the, this weight is one, the weight of the single vertex is one, and the weight of the uh, cor we get a weight r per corner and a weight x for for vertical vertical edge and y for horizontal edge. So I'm just putting these. So the, you, know, you, you see only three parameters here. That's because of the five initial parameters, I rescale to reduce the number of parameters by one. But also every time I see a right corner, I also see a left corner. Uh, uh, so I can compare. I can pair up those two two weights and only the product of these two weights really 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 pays any role. So there's really only three parameters in the model and I'm calling them you know x, y, and r. So if you like, uh, it's a configuration of, of uh, non-intersecting lattice paths like this with a where configuration has probability uh, on a finite graph it's e to the vx uh, plus hy. So uh, uh, v and h are the number of vertical edges and the number of horizontal edges. X and Y are parameters, R is a parameter, and C is the number of corners. So each time you turn a corner, you get a factor of R in your probability. And, and Z is this, uh, of course, the normalization constant, the partition function. Uh, so yeah, this is a special case of the six vertex model. If you know what the delta parameter for the six vertex model, you take delta to infinity or minus infinity, and this is what you will get. But it's also a generalization of the Lozenstein model that we started at the beginning. If you set R to be one, if you set the little R parameter to be one, this is exactly the Lozenstein model. Any questions about the definition of the model? Here's, how is it, how is it, how can you think about the Lozenstein as a lattice path model well, if you just look at this picture and you think about the path consisting of green and blue lozenges, they sort of make this uh, northeast going lattice pass and you sort of project it in the right direction and you'll see this uh, lozenge time. So when R is not equal to one, it means that the blue and green lozenges have some interaction. Either they, either they prefer to be adjacent if R is bigger than one or they don't like to be adjacent if R is less than one. Right, and here's some, here's some uh, very simple simulations. When R is large, oh, so first of all, here, here's the R equals one case. This is just the loss and styling model again, but in this new, mm, new, way to, new way to look at the loss and styling model. When you increase R, then the paths like to have lots of corners. So the best thing they can do is sort of wiggle back and forth, uh, having corners essentially everywhere. When R is very small, the paths don't like to have corners and so they tend to go uh, straight for long, long uh, periods before turning. I'm sorry, but in the in the lozenge tiling, it seems to me that you have vertices where you have four bones entering into a uh, into a single site. No, if you go back to your colored picture, yes, here. Yeah. Sometimes you sometime you you have this uh, right. <clears throat> Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not, we're not using the same projection. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, how to explain? It, uh, if you take the, you take, the, you, you draw the, the black path through the centers of the, of the green and blue things. 
And there, and then if you have two, if if two paths that hit each other, they still, they still. I agree. Hit, I agree. I agree. Oh, I okay. 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 Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, so if R is very small, there's something interesting going on when R is very small and you increase the density. That is, you increase the other two variables, X and Y. Uh, then you can sort of see in the simulation, it's not very clear that there's some sort of large scale structures that are starting to appear. I don't know, you sort of see this sort of staircase, staircase uh, uh, structures. And that's gonna make the model, uh, okay, so uh, different. Well, here is, here's a picture of the surface tension. You have to, I'll, I'll explain, I need to explain how to find the surface tension, but uh, one can go through the, the calculation to find the surface tension in the five verdicts model. It's, it's quite complicated, but you know, here's the, here's the answer. And it has an interesting phenomenon which doesn't happen for the Dimer model, which is that it's only piecewise analytic. Uh, it's got two pieces. Uh, so sorry, I drew minus sigma uh, just because you can see the, the curvy part better. So there's this nice uh, analytic, strictly convex part here. And then there's this uh, region near the, near the diagonal where the, where the surface tension is just linear. So it's not strictly convex. It loses the strict convexity uh, on this, on this uh, region near the diagonal. This is for our lesson one. Uh, there's, okay. And that non-strict convexity uh, uh, causes some non-trivial behavior in the limit shapes. I mean, uh, and oh, by the way, for the R bigger than one case, it, it's actually analytic on the whole domain, although it has this interesting boundary behavior along the diagonal. That's a, this is a vertical, uh, uh, anyway. Yeah. All right, so, what about the limit shape theory in this, in this, in this five verdicts model? When R is bigger than one, it works just like it did before because the surface tension is strictly convex, right? When R is bigger than one, R, R remember is the, is the weight per corner. So if you like to have lots of corners, the, 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 the path will still sort of repel each other and you get a nice strict convex uh, thing. And there's a unique, there exists a unique limit shape uh, for the surface tension for, for general boundary conditions like before. However, when R is less than one, uh, uh, then, then the, the theory kind of breaks down because of the, because you lose, when you lose strict convexity, you no longer have the existence of a unique limit shape. Uh, there is a unique, a unique limit shape as long as you stay in the strict, strictly convex region Long as long as the minimizer has its gradient in the what we call the repulsive region, uh, but uh, in the in the other case, we don't we, we can't prove the existence of a unique limit shape, and we conjecture and we think that there's no unique limit shape in general. However, what we can prove is that the set of minimizers, which may be not just a point. The set of minimizers is a convex set in the sense that the, you know, the convex combination of two minimizers is still a minimizer. And they all share the same uh, liquid region, that uh, disordered region uh, in the center. And some pictures are worth, worth uh, I think some pictures will help explain the theorem because I didn't explain it very well. Here's a, this is again a, that uh, hexagon, the same boundary conditions, the hexagon boundary conditions. If you look closely, you can see that there's paths starting at the, oh, these are not Northeast paths. I, I flipped this picture around. These are sort of Northwest Southeast paths. So the paths start up here along the diagonal edge. They go horizontal here, and then they go, they, you know, they sort of percolate down and then end up vertical over here. And the paths over here start vertical and then they end up horizontal. So this is again, the, sort of boxed plane partition limit shape, but when R is slightly less than one, and you can still see that it has some nice, you know, faceted regions near the corners, uh, uh, and this nice disordered region in the center. Although there's something, uh, something a little 
suspicious going on near the centers of the two sides. And that, you, you know, if you notice that, that's good because there is something suspicious going on there. Uh, <clears throat> and so here, I'm, let me describe the results. Uh, this is an exact, this is the result of an exact calculation for the limit shape. Uh, and indeed, there are faceted regions near the corners, but the boundary, the, this Arctic boundary between the frozen regions and the rest is only piecewise analytic now. Uh, with the, you can see the red dots are the maximal, delimit the maximal domains of analyticity for the boundary. Uh, uh, and, but near the centers of the sides, there's some mis mystery region which we don't understand. And that's because the, the slope moves into that region where sigma is not strictly convex. And as far as we know, there's no limit shape in this region, in this region uh, that you see right near the, well, it's kind of small on your screen, but uh, there's, no, there's no limit shape here. Every limit shape will share the same uh, interior part and also the same facets here. But in this region, as far as we know, uh, uh, there's no uh, limit shape even in the scaling, in the scaling limit. What, what the words this, this region means? <laughs> this region, there is no limit shape. Oh, so, you so see how, that... how, where, where, what's the boundary between this one and the complement of it where you have the limit shape? Yeah, that's a good question, right? So this, uh, oh, near the corner, there's a facet. And then uh, you see that red dot there, uh, that red dot between, uh, right? And, and the, the blue curve, everything inside the blue curve is, is determined and unique. And everything near the corners are facet, but then there's this region, which I think is delimited by this red tangent line. And then between the, sorry, you can't see it very well on your screen, it's very small, but there's this thin region because the blue curve does not actually hit the boundary there. There's a little gap uh, there and we don't know what the height function is doing there. The region of the size of the whole system, right? I mean, the, the, the yeah. diameter is of the order of this, the whole system, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. So it's not infinitesimal. In no, 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 not at all. Not good, at all. good, good, good. Okay, okay, now I see. Uh -huh. Right. In fact, if I decrease r, you, this region gets bigger. In fact, here's this. Here's a picture. You see, here's r is 0.6. Here's r is 0.36. And you know, as r gets smaller, at some point, when r equals one third, the the region where we understand things. Uh, disappears completely, <laughs> right? So the, the oval, the egg, the lemon or whatever it is, the disordered region, as you decrease R, uh, decreases and at some point it in fact disappears completely. And then when R equals one third or less, uh, nothing is known. I mean, as far as we know, the limit shape is random throughout the whole, uh, the whole hexagon. So this is the, for these particular boundary conditions, the box plane partition boundary conditions, the liquid the liquid region, the disordered region where we understand things uh, collapses completely when R decreases to one third. And you can see that in the simulations. Let me just show you these simulations. Here's R equals 0.4. This is supposed to be a reasonably good approximation to the uniform, I mean, not the uniform, but the an exact, sim, an exact sample. Uh, when R equals 0.4, you still see the facets near the corners. Uh, and you can imagine that somewhere along <laughs> here, there's some limit shape, it's very hard to tell. But then there's these large structures forming near the edges. And when R goes to, if I take R less than one third, like 0.25, then these sort of large structures invade everything, at least uh, in the center. And you know, you. See, if I did another random sample, you would see something completely looks very different than this one. So we suspect, although we can't prove that there's no, there's no limit. There's no limit shape in this, in this uh, region. In this, in this drawing, you have like uh, three stairs, right? Three steps, it makes three yeah. steps. So, yeah. so in, 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 a, in, another, in another simulation, you might have five of them. This is exactly. what you're saying? That's right. That's right. Oh, I see. Uh, so it's it's still random. It looks still random. We can't oh, prove it, oh. but uh, it looks still random. Uh, 
Uh, but we can, what we can so prove is, is there this are. This is like a glass, yeah. This is like a glass, so there is a large number of minima. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. In fact, you can prove that there are many minimizers to the problem. Like when R is less than one third, there's, here's, a, here's a particular piecewise linear minimizer. And in fact, there's sort of a you know, uncountable number of minimizers uh, uh, to the actual variational problem. Um, so the variational problem certainly does not give you any information about the, it's not, it's not just that, we, that we're not smart enough, it's just that if once you've formulated the variational problem, you, there are many minimizers. It's possible that a more detailed analysis with including some lower order terms will rule out many of these minimizers, but we don't know how to do that kind of calculation. Uh, on the other hand, when R is bigger than one, everything works nice. Uh, uh, there is always a unique minimizer because we have strict convexity and so on. Uh, uh, so, right, I, I don't have some good pictures for that, but there you have it. Uh, so the, the, the five vertex model is a case where we can do the exact calculation of the surface tension, uh, but it has this feature that at least when R is less than one, there may not be uniqueness of limit shapes. However, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, in, in the disordered region, there is a unique limit shape and we have, we can solve that exactly. And this, this picture here, these level lines you see are the exact uh, solution because of, the, because of the theory of this uh, harmonic extension business. All right. Uh, uh, let me just say in the last few minutes here how we saw, how we find the surface tension because that's kind of an interesting and non-trivial calculation for the Viper Dix model. Uh, how to find the free energy? In fact, uh, once we find the free energy, the surface tension is just the Legendre dual of the free energy. Uh, and uh, unlike the Dimer model, there's no sort of de magic determinant formula which will tell us what the free energy is. So we went back to the original formulation uh, of the beta ansatz, where you put the model on a cylinder, uh, uh, right? So a cylinder of circumference capital N, and then you try to diagonalize the transfer matrix. What is the transfer matrix? Is the matrix which uh, counts configurations on a cylinder uh, and Every time you add a row of uh, uh, to the cylinder, you know uh, the, the uh, you keep track of the current current configuration, and then adding a row is just a multiplication by some matrix. Um, what is the what is the transfer matrix? It's a matrix which is indexed by configurations on a given row of the cylinder. Like uh, you know, on each row you have a certain set of paths coming up and uh, leaving from above. And the matrix tells you, you know, the current, the weight of all possible ways to complete the configuration on a given row. Like I'm starting in configuration one five six, and I'm leaving in configuration three five seven. What's the matrix element? Well, I'm going to get four four copies of R because there are four corners, and then there's uh, one two three horizontal edges. So I'm going to so I'm going to get three copies of Y, e to the three Y. So that's the weight. So you make this big matrix which has two to the n by two to the n. I mean, it's a two to the n by two to the n matrix of, this, of these entries of this type, and you need to find the leading eigenvalue of that matrix that will give you the free energy, right? Uh, T to the K of AB is the total weight of configuration starting in state A and ending K step later in state B. It's just some sort of uh, uh, enumeration, way to enumerate the states. And the free energy is of course the limit of the log of the eigenvalue as n gets large, log divided by n. And it looks kind of like an impossible task because this matrix is huge, two to the n by two to the n. Uh, there's some partial diagonalization you can do because the number of particles is preserved, the number of paths is preserved from one row to the next. So you can split the matrix into, into n different blocks, n plus one different blocks, where e, on each block tk, you have only k particles. So you've reduced your work a little bit, but uh, uh, it's still 
you know, still looks impossible. But the beta ansatz uh, is a sort of guess for the form of the eigenvectors of that matrix. And, you know, which you can, if you work out the small eigenvectors for T1 and T2 and so on by hand, you can make, a, make an educated guess about the form of the eigenvectors for TK when you have K particles for this transfer matrix. And it turns out that they have this nice form. Uh, it's a sum over the symmetric. So what is it? This is an, supposed to be an eigenvector. X1 through XK are the positions of the particles coming in. Uh, uh, and the eigenvector evaluated at that uh, component depends on a bunch of uh, uh, parameters, zeta one through zeta k, and some other parameters, a sub pi. Uh, and it, but it turns out to be, it's just a sum of these sort of uh, exponential waves, uh, sum over the symmetric group of k elements, uh, this thing, which you can think about as some sort of generalization of a determinant. You take this sort of Vandermond matrix and uh, you sum, but instead of summing with a signature, you sum with some other function a, which depends on pi. It's you know it's it's a sort of a well-known technique, but well-known and complicated, I would say. Uh, you know, very few people I think really have got to the heart of this uh, technique. Uh, but you can read the Baxter's book and get some appreciation for for it. Uh, and as we said, the five vertex model is a special case of the six vertex model. People have worked out the equations for the six vertex model. If you, if you then take the appropriate limit for this five vertex model, you know, you still have to solve this system of polynomial equations for these special parameters, the zetas. Uh, but something nice happens. The, these, the equations decouple in a, in a certain nice way. The, on the right-hand side, the denominator here, uh, anyway, I don't wanna you know, spend too much time on this, but there is something nice which happens in the five vertex model, which does not happen for the general six vertex model. The equations decouple in a nice way and you can, you can take the denominator here and move it to the other side. And then, the, and then after this change of variables, you get a simple a polynomial equation for each beta root. And I, I I'm sorry, I, I just uh, introduced some new variables, W, J, which are just scaled for copies of the beta roots and they satisfy W to some power times one minus W to some power equals, and then the left hand, the, the right hand side is just some constant because it's symmetric in all the Ws. Anyway, the long story short, the you can identify where the beta roots are explicitly in the complex plane, uh, they lie on these nice curves, which are called Cassini ovals. And because you can identify those curves, uh, the rest of the the rest of the calculation sort of follows through. Uh, the calculation, which we can't really do for the six vertex model, we can do for the five vertex model because we have such an explicit formula for the for the curves where the roots lie. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, the leading eigenvalue is this kind of complicated expression in terms of the roots. Uh, uh, and you can perform the integral and get the surface tension. And here's the kind of amazing geometric fact which falls out of that calculation. That's kind of a long and tedious calculation which I, I, I couldn't, couldn't find any easy way to present. So let me just give you the conclusion which is really kind of amazing, uh, I find. Uh, if I take a triangle with, in the, in the you know, Euclidean triangle in the plane with vertices zero, one, and Z. Z is in the upper half plane. And so R is less than one. So let me put one minus R squared is somewhere between, on the line between zero and one. And now I make this, uh, this little triangle here uh, z zero and one minus r squared. I, I draw a circle there, and I you know that circle intersects the line between z and one at this point w bar. That's the conjugate of w. Uh, then you look at this angle, that angle, that angle, and that angle, and the the ratio between this angle and that angle is s over one minus s. That is that is you know theta. Well, pi minus theta is this angle. <laughs> uh, 
I apologize, I'm going too fast. You, the, you start with the, this triangle, Z is this parameter here, some arbitrary point in the upper half plane. You build all this uh, geometric thing. This defines S, right? Because the ratio of this angle here and that angle there is S over one minus S. And then you can get T because once you know S, you get theta. From theta, you can get T, you can get one minus S minus T over here. This determines S and T as a function of this parameter Z. Right? Z is an arbitrary point in the upper half plane. Once you know Z, you can determine S and T. That, then you prove that Z is the conformal parameter for this model and S and T are the slopes. And if you wanna know what X and Y are in terms of Z, you know, some explicit formula for X and Y involving the dialogue rhythm. Conclusion is that, you know, uh, writing the explicit formula for, for X and Y as a function of S and T is very complicated, but if you go through the intermediary of this complex coordinate Z, then you can write S and T and X and Y as functions, as simple, reasonably simple functions of Z. And uh, th this is all a result of that kind of long and intricate calculation of the beta ansatz. I don't know how to get this diagram exactly, but the diagram really sums up the whole uh, model. And uh, from this picture, you can then obtain all these plots that I've been uh, showing. All right, that, that's uh, all I want to say. So let me just stop there uh, and skip to the end, unless there are some questions. Uh, may I ask, uh, uh, could you return to these uh, Cassini ovals? Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, when so what you actually need, you as I understand, you need to finally to find this function sigma, right? That's right. We're looking for sigma. Yes. But what we're going to find first is the free energy. And the, the my question is the following. Uh, so to get uh, to to obtain this sigma, do we need uh, actually all the uh, states eigenstates of the Hamiltonian or or, or eigenvalues, or only the ground state? We only need the ground state, the largest eigenvalue of this uh, right. transfer matrix. And then I think that uh, the ground state you can obtain by standard method methods for the uh, six vertex model as well in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, yes, that's right. Except that the that you know the in the six vertex model, the ground state has been worked out in the thermodynamic limit only in the symmetric six vertex model, you know, the AABBCC case. Here we're doing the anti-symmetric six, the five vertex model, uh, which is not, doesn't fall into that, the setting of the solved part of the six vertex model. The six vertex model has not really the, the, There are these papers by Nolden and Bookman Shore. Uh, Bookman Shore, right. I think it's more about stochastic point, but Nolden is asymmetric six vertex model. Right, in the stochastic point you can solve, but the general asymmetric six vertex model has not been solved. Nolden sort of stops at the, the equations with the analogs of these equations. Okay. Uh, uh, but of course you can write some sort of integral equation for the, for the leading eigenvector, right. but uh -huh. nobody really knows how to solve that integral equation in terms of you know, reasonable functions that we can work with. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Richard, uh, in the usual DMR model, the surface tension is dual to Ronkin function of some surface. Is there any similar interpretation for the uh, surface tension you found? Yeah, the, well, the, right, if you go back to these pictures, the, this is the R bigger than one case. The, the, here's the surface tension. The, dual object is the free energy, which is not a Ronkin function anymore. It resembles a Ronkin function and has many of the similar properties, right? It's sort of piecewise analytic with these sort of frozen pieces here, uh, but uh, the, the, this function is not uh, an, it, it, first of all, it's not an amoeba uh, and uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to have any simple algebraic description Mm-hmm, thank you.
Any questions? Yes, uh, Rick, is your B function on the on the slide at which you're pointing with your pointer right now? Yes. Is it by any chance the derivative of uh, of this bl blocks blocks uh, function associated with the logarithm? Uh, a single value function. <laughs> I think it's called D. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, that's a good. That's uh, uh, thank you for that question because it's it's closely related to D. Uh, D of U is is the same except you replace u here with one minus u and that one minus u with u. Uh, no, but it, there you have imaginary part of dialogarithm and, and here it's what, is it? This is, this is dialogarithm. Oh, L I see, dialogarithm. Oh, there's no two, I see. see. Oh, okay. So. In some sense, if you just switch u and one minus u in this part, you will get the d function, which is actually continuous on the whole plane. The b has this two branch cuts. So it's, a little, it's not quite the same function, but it ha also has some nice properties. Uh, uh, and you can find the, in this calculation somewhere, you can find the five term relation for the dialogue rhythm appearing. So it would be nice to find some sort of geometric uh, description of this. I, I think there's some, still some geometry hiding in there, which we don't understand yet. But, but, but that would suggest that this, uh, this surface, either, surface, either the surface tension or the free energy has some, something to do with you know, maybe some hyperbolic volume of something or? Yeah, that's right, that's right. I, I feel like there's some hyperbolic geometry description uh, hiding in here, which we just haven't figured out yet. I mean, it may, may not be very difficult, but uh, there is a five term relation, like I said, which, and I think every, what I've been told is that every time you see a five term relation, there's a hyperbolic geometry description, right? And it's kind of easy to believe that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Mantra. When you look at this slide, do you see that one should can really expect that you you try to find the minimizer, and you you see that is, there is not a unique one? Can you see something in looking on those formulas? This is r less than one, right? Yeah, this is r less than one. Uh, so is 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 there? <laughs> At which point of that slide one should look in order to see that something strange will happen once you do your simulation. Is there is there something which some some sign that you can read out from it that okay. your simulations would not show would 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 uh, we would do some wild things? Okay. Yeah. So I can I can yes. Good. Right. Suppose that in, I don't give you Z, but I give you S and T somewhere in the triangle. Suppose I just give you the two numbers S and T, which uh, are, are positive, real, and li lie in that unit triangle, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And then I say, uh, find me a Z for which this angle, the ratio of this angle to that angle is S over T and so on. Theta here is a function, also a function. But the problem is you can't do that for every S and T in the triangle, right? As, as Z varies over the upper half plane, S and T will, you miss that uh, that last region, the little banana-shaped region near the mm. diagonal of the mm. triangle. Oh, I see, I see. Uh -huh. right? As as z goes tends down to the 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 line between zeros and one minus r squared, that's that's where you know you, you just don't get everything. Uh, I see. Uh, so this is this is for the analytic part of your surface tension. That's what you are saying. Okay. Right, Z, uh, Z is describing the analytic part of the surface. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. There's no the Z. Rest, the rest there. is not here. That's what you are saying. Exactly. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Uh, may I ask another question? Uh, in the region where you don't have a unit minimizer, is there any guess how the limit would look like? Is there a, is there a distribution of some? Continuous or mixture of atomic measures or anything else? Yeah, yeah, I, we don't have a guess. If you look at this picture, uh, what I would say is that if I did this simulation a bunch of times, I will always get a different thing. I'll always see some facets here and here, but the, the point where the facet ends will be a random, I mean, this point here where the facet touches the boundary will be a random location somewhere macroscopically along this edge. And likewise there, but then the interior structure, we really have no idea what's going on. Looks like, looks like you know, in this picture, picture, we see three or seven or something steps, uh, that number will probably be random. So as far as we know, it's random. Okay. 
Thank so, you. So it means that, that there are several, several uh, how to say, uh, mini, mi, uh, minimal energy configurations with, with, with comparable energies, which with equal energies or- Exactly uh, equal energies, yes. Exactly, so you have, have exactly the generic. So then you mm -hmm. need to go to further uh, in expansion in the small parameter. Right. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. one, could, one would hope that uh, by, by looking at the next term in the expansion, you could separate these. There would be some which are larger, but the, I, I, I really don't think that's gonna work. And I suspect that it's random even in the limit. I mean, that's the simplest, seems to be the simplest explanation is that it's random even in the limit. So entropy wins in that sense. You have, you have yeah. big entropy. Yeah, I mean, like we you know have exactly. Lots of states of, of the same, of, uh, you have lots of states of, uh, of, compa of the same energy. Exactly. Right. Yeah, like a Brownian motion, right? A Brownian bridge, there's lots of, uh, it's not, it doesn't have a limit shape. Right. Do we expect to have a finite number of some additional order parameters which control this phase? And uh, in general, this non-repulsive phase, uh, is it like frozen phase or how, what are the order parameters for this phase? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. But at least, at least for from numerics, can we can we expect to extract some information about or the parameters uh, relevant for this phase from numerics? Well, you know, if you just stare at the picture, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly your question. But in your picture, in this picture, you see some large scale structure there, right? There's this sort of vertical pieces and then horizontal pieces, and the the boundary between them seems to be some, you know. A roughly continuous line, right? Uh, but I don't know if that's just a, an effect of, of us. I mean, this is only 200 by 200. Maybe if I made a much larger one, I wouldn't see that structure. Yeah, but I'm asking uh, if we can, if uh, assume that we fix some uh, geometric, some additional geometric parameters of this shape. So not only like oh. this hexagonal, size of this hexagon, but add some additional geometric parameters which control these steps. Should we expect that we have to add finite number of these geometric parameters or this number would be infinite? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, uh, haven't thought about that. I mean, it's a, it's a reasonably good idea. A add some sort of Lagrange multipliers, I think, uh, mm -hmm. to the system and see, see uh, what effect those have. Mm -hmm. A good idea. Okay. Okay. More questions? If there are no questions, thanks for inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. By the way, Richard, if you're planning to be in Europe in summer, why you don't come to, to, to Moscow? You have a standing invitation. We can talk about it. Thanks. Uh, right, be between, be between be Paris be and Oberwolfa, right? You have to spend a month somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, uh, if, yeah. We'll see. I mean, uh, I'll have the family with me, so you know it's going to be harder to get away too much. But uh, okay, we can talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.